Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary or lose heart in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now we've gone ahead and talked about this morning, you know, bad seed, bad seed, you know, and kind of got a little bit toward the good seed stuff. So go back to this this morning because we don't want to cover all that. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Now verse 9 of this passage here in, in uh, Galatians says that if we don't grow weary, we'll reap in due season if we faint not. Everybody say faint not. Hallelujah. So we're going to reap. Isn't that right? We want to reap. Anybody want to reap? Anybody don't want to reap? You don't want to read bad seed, but you do want to read good seed. All right? So, um, Philip tells us not, you know, King James says don't grow weary. Philip says don't grow tired. Amplified says let's not lose heart. The true test of Christian character is that we're steadfast and don't grow weary when the trials, the tribulations, the attacks, the dry places come. Instead, we don't pass our profession. We continue to sow imperishable seed. We continue to do the will of God. And then as Philip says, the ultimate harvest is assured. So this, we can sow and reap in famine. Now let's run over to the 11th chapter, the book of Hebrews. Because we want examples. Amen? Hallelujah. All right. Am I coming across out there? Don't hear me in the speaker? All right. I do not hear myself at all. So it makes it a little... I'm um, sitting so there wondering if they hear me. That I shouldn't warn her, but I can definitely know that I can project. All right, Hebrews 11th chapter. Now we're going to start down here. Uh, you know, we read the first part, we always read the first part. Let's start in verse um, 7. It says, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. Prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by, by the which he condemned the world, and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go and to, out to a place which he should have received for inheritance, obeyed. There's a word underlined. The New Testament says that part of Abraham's walk of faith was obedience. Everybody say obedience. I mean, I'm emphasize it, obedience. Some people were about saying, you don't have to obey. Well, you know, Abraham received because he obeyed. After, let's say, they should go out to receive for inheritance, obey, he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sowed in the land of promise, as a strange, in a strange country, well in the tabernacles of Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith, Sarah, also Sarah received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered a child which was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky and multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, having not having not received the promises, and having seen them far off, persuaded of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, had they been mindful of the country that they, which they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that hath received the promises, <clears throat> offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Crying that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, and whence also he received him in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of the staff. By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the committed children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a prophet child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was coming to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasure of the sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he, did, um, he had respect for the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. Through faith, he kept the Passover 
and the sprinkling of blood, lest that he had destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed over the Red Sea by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do so were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down, after they were compassed by seven days. By faith the heart of Rahab perished not for them that believed not, when she had received the spies of peace. And what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith of the subdued kingdoms, brought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of the lands, quenched the violence of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant, and fight, uh, turned to the Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, uh, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. We'll just stop right there. <clears throat> now, the, the, this chapter talks about men and women who didn't lose heart. Yeah. When you look at the different people we just listed here, I mean, David, we look at Samson, we look at Abraham, we look at all the different ones there, they could have all gotten weary or a little lost heart and gave up. Couldn't they? Every one of them. I mean, think about David. I, I think of David uh, when when they had gone out to chase the enemy, and when they got back to the, when they when they when lost the pursuit and came back home, their town was burned, their wives and the children were all gone, and the men were not happy. Right, right. Amen. But the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. That's what David did. There. Hallelujah. You know when he could have lost heart, when he could have quit, when he could have thrown his up hands up and say, "Why me, Lord?" What did I ever do? I mean, you know, I know that. We didn't want to go to that song. That, that song was. Hallelujah. It was what it was. Can you say amen? But all these people, I mean, think of, think of, 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 of um, Samson, who got so deuced by the delight, who gave in to the flesh, who got his eyes put out, who made a slave, had his hair shorn, lost all of his strength. Amen. But you know, um, it's not that his hair grew back again. Yeah. And he didn't lose heart because in the very end he killed more Philistines in one one act than he did in all his life before. Amen. Because he turned to God. Amen. See, now here's the thing. You can you can even miss the mark. You can lose you can lose things, but if you'll get back, repent, get back in with God, you'll gain your courage back. Right. Because the strength and the courage comes from God. It doesn't come from you anyway. It's, it's a courage and a strength that comes out of God. Be strong and very courageous. Amen. But how can we be strong and courageous? Because the Lord our God is with us. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm the friend that sticks closer than a rope. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. And so we find all these all these people here that we just read about. If we run up to Hebrews chapter 12, wherefore seeing we are compassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses. Who are the witnesses? All those people who didn't lose heart. All those people who, who ended up finishing strong. God is strong. Amen? Amen? God is strong. They, they, made, they, made, they made it through. And, they, and they, were, they didn't lose heart. I mean, even in the midst of when they had messed up. See, I tell you, when you mess up, you can lose heart. You can just say, forget it. I'm yeah. done. I quit. I, I just give up. You know, I made a mistake. I blundered. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a failure. And just quit. Or you can take up, you can take up once again. And run your race. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You can let the wind of the spirit blow into blow into the valley of the dry bones. The flesh yeah. will send you back on. Yeah. And the breath of the spirit back in your life. And you can pick up and run your race again. Uh, how many ever saw Chariots of Fire? Yeah. All right. Awesome movie. I know there's a lot of people who know it. it <clears throat> um, and it was powerful. Man, I, I, I think it may have won the Grammy for the soundtrack. You know, the, the score, the musical score. Dun, 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 Anyway, I'm not going to go any further than that. All right? I've seen something over there on the house, and he said, no, Daddy, no, no, no. it, it, it falls, it doesn't go up. <laughs> right? And so I sang it again, no, 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 you got to go. And he sang it, he went down, and I sang it, and I went back up. So, <clears throat> I'm done. Hallelujah! I've lost heart concerning becoming a musician and a singing star. Hallelujah. But I remember that, that, that scene where um, Eric Little is running and uh, Abrams is up in the stands watching the race. And he's in the curve and the guy comes in and bumps him into the, into the field, the inner field, and he just rolls over and they're all just running away from him. And, and it's all in slow motion. And it's just like, you know, it's real slow. And he sits there just for a second 
And then he kind of gathers himself and starts getting up, and he gets on the track, and he begins to run, and try to get in the movie, he ran like this, you know, his head back. Everything you shouldn't do when you're running, but anyway. You know, and Abram was up there and with his program in his hand, and he's crunching it because he's watching this athlete not give up and not quit. I mean, he was knocked down, but it wasn't knocked out. When Paul said, I may be knocked down, but I'm not knocked out. Glory to God. And I mean, <clears throat> he's way behind the pack, and he's just running, and he's running, and he's, and but all of a sudden he gets overtaken one by one because there's something on the inside of him as a winner. Something on the inside of him says, don't quit. You know, and Abram's up there watching it because then one day he may have to run against this guy, and it's, he's just crunching that program in his hand. You know, I mean, just enthused and just, uh, in one sense, having high respect for the, the courage and the, the whatever of this athlete not to quit. And right at the very end, he passes the last guy and breaks the finish line. Of course, you're supposed to. And this is a true story. Uh, the uh, Chariots of Fire is a true story of those two athletes. <clears throat> and so, you know, a little that represented England and, and Abrams. Uh, I forgot what country he was running for. He was a Jew. You know, we were, we were, it was the parallel of the Christian and the Jew, and, you know, and so forth. And, uh, but, but the fact was, he didn't lose heart. Even when he should have and could have quit. If they had gone back and looked at the film, they were seeing he was knocked down and pushed out of the arena, you know, and he, he the, the guy should have been penalized and disqualified that did it. But, you know, he could have whined about it for the next 25 years, how he lost that yeah. qualifier, and yeah. he didn't run the Olympics or whatever. But he didn't quit. He didn't lose heart. He picked up. And even though at that moment he was behind, he began to, you know, he, he, in the movie he was talking about how the, the, he, he feels his pleasure. When he runs, he feels the pleasure of God upon his life. Was a scar, you know. Uh, anyway, he just felt God's pleasure. Had to do Amen. He ran for God's pleasure. He ran for God. And I tell you, Christian, we need to run again for God. Not lose heart. Keep our heart going out there. Yeah. <coughs> amen. Huh? Can you say amen? Yeah. Now, Hebrews chapter 12 says those, those witnesses are in the black great uh, grandstand of heaven. Well, what are they doing? They're telling you, you can make it. You can see it through. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't throw in your hand. Don't give, throw in the towel. Don't lie down and quit. But keep going. Keep keep going. Keep going. And you're going to see it through and reap the reward. Can you say amen? amen? I mean, many times we even feel like we've made an irreversible spiritual blunder or something. So devastating. Uh, something so devastating has happened to us. We're no longer useful for his service. But listen to the words of the Apostle Paul as he reflects on his own life. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have made it, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Yeah. Hallelujah. And reaching forth unto those things that are before, I press. Oh, I love that. This is, a, this is something that was going to come in my heart as I began to put this together. I press. So I wanted to get there this morning, but we didn't get there this morning. So those who went home and didn't come back tonight missed out on this part. Because the other thing I was saying before is getting to this. Paul said, I pressed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If we're going to win the prize, we got to press. We got to look at the mark and we got to we got to set our eye on the mark and we got to go to the mark. And we got to listen, you're going to have to press. There are going to be times where you're pressing. And you're getting all the resistance in the world. Uh, amen? amen. You know, the Panthers today almost pressed in for a win, except they phoned them all the three yard line. Went downstairs to the whole family. I said, well, guess what? The Panthers lost the opening game for the third season in a row. Surprise, surprise. You know, it's not happening. Anyway, I'm glad I did what I did. I was asleep through most of the game. I, I, I woke up a lot to see the last four minutes and 35 seconds, and that's all I needed to see. <laughs> Hallelujah. But Paul said, I press. This does not mean you lie down and do nothing. Pressing denotes effort. Yeah. Pressing denotes, denotes that you're pushing, that you're, 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 you're working against something that is resisting you. If you're pressing into something, there's effort being exerted. Amen. There, and there is a resistance to your getting when you're trying to get to. There is demonic resistance to you getting to your promise. Satan doesn't want you to make it to the end. 
Satan, and if you do make it to the end, he wants you being drug across the finish line, barely getting in, as we as we say, and this is, I, this is one of the sayings you think, where did they get that from? Because we don't have any, and that is made in by the skin of your teeth. Your teeth don't have skin. But we say, you remember that saying? Made in by the skin of the teeth. Well, anyway, we get the point. We slid right in, you know? Slid in the last, right at the last second, just got in. I mean, well, you know, Satan's trying to stop you. And he doesn't want you to, to get there. And so you got to be like Paul and say, I, I, I don't count myself to apprehend But I do forget those things that are behind. Those are Satan you use your past. Yeah. He'll use any failures you experience. He'll use any shortcomings that you've had. He'll use any mistakes that, you, that you've encountered. And he'll use that against you to paint a picture of unworthiness or lack of faith or anything else he can paint up about you. Paul said, I forget those things. Why? Because he's pressing towards something. He's pressing toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. He's not going to lose heart in near the end of the race because of something he did 15 years ago. Or maybe 15 minutes ago. Amen? What do you do if you did 15 minutes ago? You do the same thing you did 15 years ago. You repent, put it in the blood, and go on. But you forget those things that are behind. Can you say amen? Why don't we repent? Maybe that's why you're not pressing. Yeah. You've lost courage because you're not, you know, something right. Come on now. Now we got, we got to forget the past. The past. That was terrible. We got to forget the past <laughs> and press toward the mark. Everybody say, forget the past. Yeah, forget. Come on now, forget the past. Yeah, forget press the toward the mark. Press toward the mark. Forget the past. Forget the press toward the mark. We got to make a song. Forget the past. Press toward the mark. Anyway. Paul's here. Paul, here comes Paul. Saying, now think of what Paul did. Can you, can you think of the things Paul did? First, and one of our first encounters with Paul is, is he's standing there holding the coats of the men who stoned Stephen. Hello? And was consenting yeah. unto his death. As a matter of fact, it so stirred up his religious zealousy of Judaism that he went and got letters from the chief priest and began to go search out any who were in that way so they might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Hello? He was a Christian killer. The Bible says, Paul yet breathing out threatenings or saw when the Lord met him on the Damascus road. Which, by the way, was not a social visit. Are y'all here? Right. The Damascus Road experience was not a social call. It wasn't a, you know, I just love you, Paul. It's not what Jesus said when he showed up. Hello? Jesus didn't look at Paul when he, he fell to the ground from his horse. Are you here? When the light right of the noonday sun came to him. What did Jesus say to Paul? Or Saul? Saul? Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say I love you. See, he's running around just <clears throat> pressing sloppy and copy all everybody. Everybody's going to get everybody. Says, oh, it's just wonderful. And, you know, Jesus came to stop Saul from hurting the church. Let me tell you something. It was the Mr. T anointing. Fool, you're getting saved or you're going to hell now. You ever, you ever see Mr. He, you know, he's a Christian. He still wears all the jewelry and stuff. He, he kind of he still talks like, you know, uh, Mr. T. Or B.A. Brax on the eight thing. He's still talking. You know, Mr. T. He still talks that way. There's a Mr. T in the You're getting saved. This is it. He says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And actually, in that conversation, we never hear the words, I love you. Now, I'm not saying love is not right and we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't love people. But I'm telling you something, God loves his church too. Yeah. And he's not going to put up with people continually taking them down and hurting the church and doing damage and destruction to the church. Some people think, you know, oh, yes, he you knows. Well, Jesus did it. Jesus showed up to stop something. Let me, let me say this. Had Saul not repented, we'd have a story like this in the Bible. There was a guy who was persecuting the church who was in hell today. That would have been the end of it. 
That would have been the end of it. You wouldn't heard about the great apostle Paul. It would have been the great apostle somebody else. Jedediah or something. I don't know who had who been raised up in Paul's place if he had no kid. But somebody. Amen. Because God will get his work done. Can you say amen now? So anyway, uh, Paul was a Christian killer. And then Paul did some bonehead stuff even after he got saved. I mean, he made vows and shaved his head and, you know, all kinds of stuff that really had nothing to do with faith, living life of faith. But as he grew in the Lord and, and, and so forth, he got better. Amen. I mean, he rebuked the chief priest. <laughs> and then had to repent. I didn't, I didn't know it was the chief priest. You know? Amen? Yeah. But you know what he did? Later in his life, he said this, I forgive those things that are behind. I press toward the mark. Now, let me say this. He counted even his successes. He forgot those. He, just didn't, he didn't stop and do a happy dance about his successes. And he didn't stop and wallow in the mire about his failures. He just kept pressing toward the mark. Yeah. And the Bible says, when, and, you know, when Paul writes and talks about uh, the things he went through for the gospel's sake, and he gets over to the next chapter after that and says this. He said, there was given unto me, he said, for, uh, unless I be exalted above measure, there was given unto me a messenger of Satan, born in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, and angel, actually, angel in Greek, of Satan, the buffet me. Now, I was just talking with, with, a, with another minister uh, the other day, and he, and he was sharing. He said, we ever start to think that you know, being exalted above measure could be something other than Paul being exalted above measure measure in being prideful about his revelation. How about being exalted above measure in, towards the kingdom of Satan where he walked in the revelation of what he had. See, we've always taught it and always believed that God didn't want Paul to get too lifted up in pride so he let Satan put a bet of thorn in his flesh. How about Satan didn't want him to get to the point he actually walked in all the revelation he was teaching and sent to stop him. Hello? Because number one, Satan's not God's guard dog. That's right. We know it was the messenger of Satan, the Bible Paul said so. Hello? So God and the devil don't work in cahoots together. Right. Are you here? Just a thought. We always try, we always try to say, oh, God didn't want to get this and pride. How about Satan didn't want to actually walk in that revelation? Well, because we walked in that revelation and taught that revelation, the church would be empowered with an authority that would dismiss his king from us. And I, I hear that people just got out the WD 40 with the brain and started spraying in there. That's why I keep spraying a little stuff. Hallelujah. They passed that message of everything I've ever believed. Good. We know that it wasn't off the mountain, which they always try to teach him, you know, in, in seminaries and stuff. They had some kind of oriental rough, pussy eye disease. He said it was the messenger of Satan. Amen. Which was figurative speech. You know, a thorn in his flesh was figurative of being irritated all the time. Satan constantly tried to take Paul out. If you read the previous chapter from that, from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter, oh, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where he lives when he was in perils, 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 not in perils, in perils. Right. Those were all the buffet things he went through to preach the gospel. Jesus said, Jesus said, you will suffer persecution for my name's sake. Sickness is not persecution. Amen. <coughs> Being shot because you're a Christian is persecution. Being beat because you won't deny Jesus is persecution. Oh, big difference. Amen. So anyway, Paul had to press through stuff to get to where he wanted to go, didn't he? Didn't he? So if you read Second Corinthians chapter eleven, you know, well, let's go there real quick. And we're not going to spend a lot of time. I'm going to read everything. Verse 24, chapter 11. Of the Jews, five times received out 40 stripes, save one. That means five times he got 39 stripes. Well, five times 40 is 200. That means he received 195 stripes from the Roman scourge. Are you here? I said, are you here? Um, 
thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned and left for dead. Remember that. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. Night and day I've been in the deep. This is in journeys often, perils often, perils, in, uh, I mean, uh, in perils of waters, perils of robbers, perils of my own country, and that's the worst kind. I mean, perils about the heathen. You know, you can understand the heathen with your own people. In perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Weariness, painful, and watches, and often, and hunger, and thirst, and fast, and often, cold, and naked. Besides those things, that which is that was, that was without, that which come upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Now, he went through a bunch of stuff. What? He had to press toward the mark. Paul even got to a certain place. He said this, I'm in a, I'm in a difficult place. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. I'm in a difficult place. Whether to depart and do the Lord or stay with you in the flesh because you need it. And he says, because you need for me to stay, I'm staying. Amen. He had to make himself stay. You know, he wanted to go. He could have gone home, but see, he had to finish his course. Now, later, after, even after he said that, later he writes this, in 2 Timothy to his, to his young uh, protege, Timothy. In the fourth chapter, the seventh eight verses, he says this: "I fought a good fight. He pressed. I finished my course. He pressed. I kept the faith. He pressed. Yeah. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous Judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to unto all of them also that love is appearing." Now, notice he says this: "I fought a good fight. He had to press. He had to fight to press." He finished his course. In other words, he saw the goal, he pressed toward it, and he got there. And he kept the faith. Yeah. He didn't lose heart along the way. He kept pressing, he kept fighting, he kept his eye on the goal, and he kept his faith out there working for him. Amen. So nobody can say this. He said, I didn't lose heart, therefore my ultimate harvest is assured. Paul got his reward. He didn't quit. Paul got his reward because he didn't lose heart. Paul got his reward because he didn't throw in the hand and, and, and give up. He kept pressing. He kept pressing. Yeah. He kept pressing. And I want to tell you, if you'll keep pressing, if you'll keep pressing, if you'll keep pressing, you'll get your reward. Amen. You can sow the right kind of seed in life. Amen. And get your heart by pressing and not quitting. Everybody say, I press and I don't quit. I see the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus and I stay focused on him and I'm running my race and I'm pressing forward and my ultimate harvest is assured in Jesus name. Amen. Everybody say Shundai.